right, so it's my privilege and honor to introduce our final speaker of the day, Dr. Brian Thomas Swin. Yay! Thank you. You wanted me to stop there, but I'm going to give one more minute of an introduction. So Brian is um, a cherished faculty member in both the Ecology, Spirituality, and Religion program here at CIAS, and also in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program here. And Brian is a mathematical cosmologist by training, and he is the co-author with Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker of The Journey of the Universe, also the co-author with Thomas Berry of The Universe Story, and he's written um, a few books by himself as well, like um, The Hidden Heart of the Cosmos and The Universe is a Green Dragon, and he's done educational se video series like the... Canticle to the Cosmos, Earth's Imagination, and the Powers of the Universe. And Brian has such incredible passion and enthusiasm for helping us to, to reinvent the human, to, to come up with this uh, new story of the human's place in the cosmos. And, and it's, just, um, it's just so wonderful to be able to work with you, Brian. And um, so today, Brian is going to, to close our summit with a talk entitled the World Religions in the Context of Contemporary Cosmology. So without further ado, Dr. Brian Thomas Quinn. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Just so great to be here. And I really appreciate the fact that you're still here. It's a big surprise, but it's great. I wanted to uh, go through... <clears throat> 507, all right? Um, I want to go through my ideas uh, at a very slow pace and yet finish early so that we can uh, not just talk about the ideas I'm going to present, but everything that's come up during the day. And I want to bring it all to a closure, all right? So that if you have any antagonisms or confusions, whatever they are, bring them to me. All right. What's the word for that? <laughs> Hubris. <laughs> so, I just to make the whole thing circular, at the very beginning, Dr. Elizabeth Allison, right there, uh, started off and said, what we need is, among other things, but one way to talk about it is a change in consciousness and conscience. I think conscience is the hard part, so I wanted to talk about change in consciousness, and there are, I mean, so many things that could be said about uh, our change in consciousness. I'm just going to bring one approach to this question, and that is picking up on, on Dr. Nelson. Is Dr. Nelson still here? Yeah. Dr. Nelson uh, and her word, uh, cosmovision. So, I mean, which I love. Uh, I, I'm not sure I've ever heard it before, but I just instantly love it. And, and I also love the idea that that in, in, in her work with indigenous people, there are just so many different cosmovisions. This is just another one, right? But this one is, this one is coming out of uh, contemporary science. So it, it doesn't mean that it's, that it's better, right? If you were all scientists, I'd be saying, well, of course, this means that it's better. You know, I mean, it's all what, what, the cultural assumptions we bring to it. This is yet another cosmovision. But it has, it just has the, a sense of um, being current in the in the scientific world. But let me say this now. <clears throat> it all comes down to understanding what we mean by the number two. So, what is the number two? Now, I, I could have picked a different number. Like, in fact, I'll jump to the number five. It doesn't matter which number you pick, but you have to get a, just a sense of the strangeness of it, all right? If you get a sense of the strangeness of it, you will see that all of our difficulties right now on the planet will unravel right before your eyes. If you just get a feeling for the strangeness of the number five. So the question is, uh, where did the number five come from? Well, uh, we we at least know that the humans came up with an idea of five. Uh, 
the universe came up with the idea of five, but humans brought the idea of five into consciousness. But, you know, if you have, you've got five chairs, you've got five books, you've got five uh, monkeys, right? There was a time when a human was looking at these completely different sets and, and discovered there's something similar. They're all five. Now, you have to go back. You say, well, that doesn't seem that impressive, Brian. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, what's more obvious? Okay, go back to when we were um, apes, all right? Go back to when we were apes. That's a little more impressive, you think, of an ape doing it. Go back further, all right, back into the early mammals. So the apes come out of the mammals. The first mammal was a little shrew, right? Well, I guess that's a little more impressive that a shrew came up with the idea of five. Okay, but that doesn't impress you. Then push back further through the reptiles, all right, all the way to amphibians, go into the fish, go to the worms. The worms, they, they started off with the nervous system. What if there was a worm that came up with, hey, well, five books, five chairs, <laughs> five monkeys, that's, that's impressive, five. We'd be impressed, right? Yeah. A worm did this. Okay, but it, the fact that it came into existence is baffling. It has baffled philosophers, and we argue over where the number five comes from. We still don't know. We don't know. But once, we, once, once humans got... There was something abstract, number. They entered into a process that led to our moment right here. It, just think of this. If we go back and, and you look at, you go back uh, four million years, our ancestors all right, are, are four feet high and they're hairy and they, they scamper around and so forth, all right? No one in a million years would think they'd be a problem. They're happy, they're living, they're doing their thing. And the only difference between them and, and ourselves are these things called ideas. That's it. Just the ideas. So the idea, as it, as it began to surface in human consciousness, there were humans that had a sense, whoa, something powerful has emerged. And at least with, in the, with the Greeks, the, we, they divinized the numbers. They were sacred. They were from another realm. You know, Plato's eternal realm. Ideas, numbers. And so we, and then this, we, this process continued. And then up until the, um, the 16th century, we have another idea, Copernicus. Later on, another idea from Newton, universal gravitation. And we, at this point, we had developed the ideas to the, to, a, to the certainty that we now had the laws of the universe. We knew the laws of the universe. And it was our minds that did this. So you talk about ego testi testicularity. I mean, we were, we were masters of the universe because we had the laws. And the universe then was, was controlled by the laws. <coughs> And so we, um, in, in a real sense, we, we enter in this process of, of thinking of nature as apart from us, it's passive, it's controlled by the laws, we've got the laws, our mind is like God, we are in charge, we're going to dominate, and uh, that is a certain kind of cosmovision, right? and, and it's, it's alive and well, and, but now it's been shattered, it's been shattered by quantum physics. It's been shattered by relativity. It's been shattered by complexity science. We, we're in this time when the, our fascination with the power of number, the power of laws, has been deeply challenged by the scientific world itself. So we are, we're, we're in between. And the, the just, the, I think, it's hard to say what Cosmovision really will surface that will replace the uh, the modern scientific. It's, it's I mean it's, it's impossible because we're in the middle of it. It took you know so long for it to be put into place and, and it's now it's shattered. What 
what might emerge. This, now here's the intuition of, that some people have. The fundamental change is that we will come to understand that there are no laws governing matter. There are no laws governing matter. Matter governs itself. And over the course of its journey, it develops certain kinds of habits and inclinations, which then are articulated in human consciousness and called laws. But it's a, it's a shift. Do you see the shift? The shift is from the focus on the science, the control, to the focus on what the universe actually does. It's the, it's the, it's the exact opposite of the, of the logical positivist program. So, uh, so then what, what does that mean for us? I, it means this, that at least within with modern industrial society, modern industrial humans, uh, at a certain point, no longer could see the universe for what it was. Rather, they took their, they took their theories and reified them. We were seeing our theories in the world. And, and Whitehead calls this the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. It's, it's universal among industrial societies, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. It's taking the theory and saying, that's what reality is. And so now it's, no, no. Now, the, the cosmic vision that's surfacing is that if we want to know the nature, we want to know the nature of the universe, we have to do what, what um, Linda, is it A-Jun? A-Jun, yeah. What A-Jun Linda uh, taught, we have to learn to listen. So it is, it isn't, we, we don't know. We have to listen to what the universe is revealing about itself. So that's the switch. That's the switch. The laws themselves are more like habits, and the, the ultimate nature of reality is coming from the universe revealing itself. So I, I wanted to give a, just a sense of, of, of this. OK, here we go. All right. This, um, this is Hubble Deep Field. So every, every dot you see, except for these two right here, all the other, all the other dots are galaxies. They're all galaxies. Each one of the galaxies consists of around 50 billion stars. The, the, the task before us in terms of human consciousness is to be able to, to, to sit and reflect on the discovery <clears throat> that we are floating in the middle of a trillion galaxies. We're floating. So it is uh, impossible to take that in in a cognitive level. Rather, it is, it's an invitation to, to dwell in the beauty way. So we're not, we're, we're a little speck, but there's beauty above us, there's beauty below us, there's beauty all around us. <clears throat> it, it, the, the, the magnitude of what we've learned um, allows us to, to, to sink into the silence of being. Which is, which is deeper than the mind, the silence of being. So here we have uh, an explosion of elementary particles. This is the universe expressing itself. 
what shattered the minds of the scientists who discovered this was the realization that the particles that were coming forth had no existence the instant before. No existence. The particles are emerging out of, out of, whatever word you use, it has to be a word that's pointing to a realm that is beyond things. It's a realm of, so a realm of generativity. So we can call it the, the uh, quantum vacuum, the quantum vacuum, and then we feel like, okay, I got it. I, I think I know what it is. You know, that's one of, the, one of the powers of language. You know, you, you think, no, we don't know what it is, but here's what we do know: that 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 each of us is composed of over ninety nine percent quantum vacuum. Each of us, our our basic nature, is quantum vacuum. So the, the current understanding in the sciences is that our universe erupted out of the quantum vacuum 14 billion years ago. This is our cosmovision. But that means, that means this, that our essential nature is that which gave birth to the universe. That's who we are. We are that, that generativity. And in the, our understanding then is that the universe is constantly flaring forth anew. Moment after moment after moment, constantly flaring forth anew. And this, I thought, <clears throat> how, how can we understand this? And, I, I thought when, um, when, when Melissa was talking about uh, addressing one another as the first human on earth, you see, that's so beautiful, so fantastic. And that is, that is some, very similar to this. I'm not saying they're the same. I'm saying we need new language to give birth to this cosmovision, this particular one. And it's that each moment, each of us is the first human being. In that moment, the universe is recreating itself, moment after moment. And every apple is the first apple. Every seagull is the first seagull. A vast cloud. And it's filled with what we call gravitational attraction. But the point is, it's attraction. We put the, we put the adjective in front of a gravitational, then we, 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 can, we can lure ourselves into thinking we know what it is. What we know is that it attracts, and that this power, uh, which Paloma is loathe to call allurement, this, this power of allurement, this power of attraction, constructs the stars, and, our, and then constructs our sun, and constructs our earth, so that we, we are the further development of this attraction. So it's, there's a way in which our desires, especially those that are brought into alignment with our world, are our way of rooting into the very nature of the universe. Okay. Um, this is a, this is Ada Karaini, 8,000 light years away. Okay, just take it in. It's a star that is exploding. Every element of carbon in your brain, every element of nitrogen in your DNA, every one came from this explosion. Not this particular one, but an explosion similar to this. The universe has a, has a deep desire to give away everything it creates. 
all of the carbon, all of the nitrogen, all of the helium that was created in the star is exploded outward. It is, it is this, this sense of, a, to use another word, a giveaway. There is, there is the intuition of giveaway is rooted in an intuitive awareness that we exist because of a cosmic giveaway. So this, um, let, me, let me just end with this. Uh, this is actually an earlier picture of the large-scale structure of the universe. Uh, it was put together by uh, Jim Peebles at Princeton, but using the Lick Observatory here in California. And there, there are better star maps now, but what I love about this is that it's so early, early on. It started in the 60s, and they... Um, they just pieced together uh, shot after shot. This is the actual universe. And the, every dot on this thing, though, is six galaxies. <laughs> every dot is six galaxies. And then um, they just painstakingly put all these down, all right? And then there's this weird stuff down here at the bottom, all right? Which is like, you know, what's going on there? Right? That's just where the finding ran out. <laughs> so you have to just, like, you have to kind of ignore it, but just keep, because this is, it would, if you really saw it, you know, we'd be inside of it. We'd be inside of it. But here it is. The large, we're the first generation to see the large-scale structure of the universe. And here it is, right? And uh, what is it revealing? So Stephen Hawking, in the 70s, uh, measured the rate of expansion. Others have measured it, and he took the rate of expansion. So you're seeing a still shot. All of these galaxies are moving away from each other. He took the, the rate of expansion and looked at it carefully using Einstein's general theory of relativity and discovered something incredible. What he discovered is that if the expansion were just slightly slower, the entire thing would collapse into a black hole. Whether or not he wanted that to happen, I don't know. But it just, it was, a, it was a stunning, stunning discovery. What it, what it means, what's the interpretation for this? It is that, <clears throat> I, said, I said if it's slower. If it's slower, it collapses the black hole. If it's faster, it goes to dust. And, the, and the, the, the stunning thing was the exactitude of it. It's one part in 10 to the 60th. Meaning that, it, that if, the, if you slowed down the expansion by a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of one percent, the universe would have been a black hole. All right. Now, what is the universe revealing? What is it showing? What it, what it shows me is that the universe is opening up so that we could exist. I don't mean like Brian as a particular person, but so that the beauty of the universe can unfold. But our very existence is related to the expansion at the beginning of time. If you altered it at any point, you would alter the possibilities of life. What, one interpretation of this is that we can see the entire thing as a developing body. This and this, this developing body, and this developing body is our body. It gives birth to our elements. It, it is who we are. We, um, we are this adventure entering into a new moment. The, um, if we looked at the, the, the expansion, and it's been going on for 13.8 billion years, and um, as is often done, if we just put it in the, in the framework of a, uh, of a year. So, so again, see, never been seen before in human history. How do we take this in? So one way is to put it all in the, in the framework of a single year. So January 1st, right? Very, very beginning, birth of the universe, explosion, all right? Uh, January 5th, are the first stars, you understand what I'm doing? You have a year, calendar year? Okay. So January 5th, 
the first stars and galaxies. There they are, the first stars and galaxies. September 14th, the birth of sun and earth. Whoa, a lot of stuff happened before we came on the scene. September 28th, the first forms of life, they had no nucleus. November 1st were the first eukaryotic cells with a nucleus. November 1st. But November 1st. November 2nd, the invention of sex. Finally, God, waiting around all this time. November 2nd, first, first, the first sexual conjugation between two different beings. All the way to December 22nd, before the first multicellular animals show up. December 25th, the first mammals. December 28th, the first primates. And then December 31st, 11.52 p.m., um, humans come on the scene. But I mean, I, you know, it's like, you know, stuff is happening. And this is, the, so we are entering into this drama, this story. And the, the, the consciousness that will change will, will relate to the way in which we understand ourselves as primarily cosmological beings, primarily, and secondarily as Americans, French, you know, Chinese. So, we have time for a few questions, responses? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was so profound. Like each sentence, I could contemplate for years. So, um, but um, but it actually gives me hope because this is a this is a paradigm shift, a consciousness shift, and um, of course, uh, being a religion scholar and um, having studied the history and philosophy of science, one of the things, two things jumped out at me when you talked about we need to listen to the universe. I kept thinking of Barbara McClintock, who was doing that way before any other scientist, where she listened to the jumping genes, where she listened to the as uh, she listened to the little corn stalk she was she was growing, which was like a whole because I was interested in a feminist conception of science, if there was such a thing. This is about thirty years ago, and then um, coming from Kabbal I don't know if you ever talked to Kabbalists, but as a um, Lurianic Kabbalah, um, which I view as a form of uh, cosmology. When they talk about the development of the spheres, they use this word, uh, Rabbi Luria or Chaim Vital uses this word called tzimtzum, which is a contraction. And what is that a contraction of? It's God removing himself from God so that there's an empty space for creation. And um, it's interesting that these Kabbalists came up with that idea like before we knew all this. Uh, thank you. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Maybe one more. It'd be nice to have a feeling response, as opposed to, um, well, I'm just picking up on our last great presentation. Maybe a feeling um, for which there are words. Wow. Awe and wonder. Right. Awe and wonder. The other, the other I, just that when you think of the story, but the other, it also, I wanted to point out, this is like, you know, Melissa's word, I, I can't I can't pronounce it, but it's the you know it's a spirit, it's a mystery that permeates all. So it, from the very beginning, it's it's permeating all, and that's at the root of our being. The, Dr. Sean Kelly, you have the last word. So it's a question for you, Brian. Uh, uh, what do you make of the timing? What do you make of the timing of the apparent uh, final, apparently finally? Uh, observing gravitational waves in this story. I mean, what, what is that, per, that, that, that experience for you, particularly? Uh, your, I mean, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you my bit on that. Um, and it, just we'll end with it. But the way I'll phrase it, I think it has to do with, with my whole talk, meaning that uh, we have this challenge of transforming consciousness. Lots of different ways. Lots of different ways. This is just one. All right? But in terms of, of 
of how a cosmo vision that places us in the universe. Our, our, our problem is that we, Thomas Berry said, that we think of the universe as a collection of objects. So, that, but it, we're not, so we, we kind of think of ourselves as in the universe with this stuff. All right, so we have this story of the gravity waves uh, predicted by Einstein 100 years ago. And so we have these two black holes that collide. Um, and it, it travels 1.3 billion light years, and we have all these ripples going through space, right? All these ripples going through space. And um, in one of our, in our seminar discussion, Monica brought up, well, you know, when we look at a video of that, we're outside looking at the waves, and the waves are going through, right? But we, we, what we have to understand is that the, the waves that are going through are altering our bodies, too, and our eyeballs and our brains. In other words, when we are witnessing a wave, but we are a wave witnessing a wave. So we, we, that's, that's, the, that's the loop that we need to enter into. We would look at this, the development of the universe. It's like, wow, 14 billion years of development, and we are inside a development that's coming into awareness of a development. So it, 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 it emphasizes the, the incomplete nature of the human, of the human process. That's where I, I have hope for that. Carl Anthony. Well, Brian, I, you know, this is stunning and I, I'm sorry to hear that. There's, this is a stunning presentation and I, I really hesitate to ask you this, but I will just do it because I'm... Let me get ready, let me get ready. Yeah, I'm on a different level here. What, what do you make of the, of the idea that there was no beginning? That there's a circular process that really this 13.7 billion year starting point was actually the end point of something else that we don't know anything about. Well, I, I love that. It's huh. a, <laughs> as much as I hate to disappoint you with antagonism, <laughs> there's not. I mean, no, I love it. I just, I think it, it just, it, like in science, we have some things have been empirically verified, and so we have a sense of like, wow, that's that's factual. But then certain things are just we can't we can't reach with our, our factual knowledge. And so we have to speculate. You know, that's, why, that's why I love the word so much, cosmovision. And so one of the, again, we're talking about this in the seminar, that Lee Smolin, one of my favorite cosmologists, that is his fundamental idea. And it, it appeals to me way more than a lot of others, that, it's, that we are in the part of a process that includes an expansion out and a collapse, and, which is a, a giant catalyst. That's very much in the uh, Hindu uh, cosmology. So I love it, Carl. Are we, are we finally in agreement after all these years? <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Well, here's the... Um... I'll have to... I'll have to...